In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain's Report, we're going to be continuing in the book of 1 Samuel. And this particular story is where Samuel first hears the call of the Lord. Now, in the time of prophets, this is in that intermediate period between judges and kings. And so we're seeing, and I mean that not by the books, I mean the actual period of people judging Israel versus Israel having an actual set king. Samuel's story really starts that off. And because of that, there had been some, a lack of God speaking to some of his judges and some of his prophets, but all of a sudden the call of the Lord, where God speaks directly to a person, comes to Samuel when he's just a child. And really watching this play out and watching this little episode in Samuel's life is fascinating for a number of reasons. First of all, one of the things that we see very early on is that when Samuel hears this call, he thinks it's Eli, the man that takes care of him, a, a priest living there in Shiloh. And so he rises out of bed and goes and talks to the priest Eli, and he says, why'd you call me? And he says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. That's a paraphrase, but that's essentially what happened. And then God calls Samuel again, and Samuel jumps up and, and heads over to Eli and says, why did you call me? He says, like I said before, I didn't call you. Go back to bed, Samuel. I mean, if you're a parent or you've ever taken care of a small child, this should be an episode that doesn't sound all that unfamiliar to you, maybe not with the calling specifically, but you can imagine the state of mind that Eli is in. And then this third time is the one that we're going to look at here in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that it was the Lord calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now, despite this being the calling of Samuel as a young child, I think there's actually several, several really fascinating lessons that we can take from this one little passage. First of all, we're not really sure how old Samuel is. The Bible's not very specific. We just know that he's a boy. He could be four or five, or he might be 12, but he's probably not 13. And the reason that we say that is, of course, in Jewish culture and Jewish society, even back then, once you were 13, you were a man. And the Bible probably would have called him a man, or at the very least a youth, to indicate that he's a teenager. Not so in this passage. And so Samuel's probably a little kid. You know, anywhere in that intermediate period between being able to talk and going through the, the becoming a man process at the age of 13. So he's somewhere in that window, we're just not sure exactly where, but the fact that God chooses to come to him as a little kid, as opposed to an adult, which he normally does with his prophets, I think is just absolutely fascinating. Maybe it's because all of the adults were not doing what they were supposed to do, and we actually talked about some of Eli's failings in a previous chaplain's report. I don't know. But I just find it fascinating that Samuel's first prophecy is, a, is as a, a little kid, as a child, before he's actually an adult. So, why do you think that God doesn't come to him in more grandiose fashion? Because I want you to think about what this story implies about God's calling to Samuel. Samuel thought that it was the voice of the only man that has really known him as, as kind of a father-son relationship. So, in some ways, it was almost like God calling to Samuel sounded like his father calling him. Now, maybe God 
used his voice and imitated Eli's voice. Maybe it was just Eli was the only person in that dwelling at the time, and so Samuel just assumed that if he heard what sounded like a grown man's voice, it must be Eli calling him. We're not sure, but it's quite possible, and I think it's even likely, this is my personal opinion, not scripture talking, that because he wanted Samuel as a little kid to be comfortable, that he just kind of spoke to him in Eli's voice. I think that's pretty likely, especially considering that Samuel was so incredibly confident, uh, confident that it was Eli calling him instead of assuming that it was something else because kids may be a little bit more gullible and naive than adults, but they know their parents' voice. And so it's interesting to me that God chooses to come to him in a form that at least sounded something like, if not exactly like, the only father figure Samuel had ever really known. I think that was an intentional choice on God's behalf to help him understand that intimate relationship that God wanted with Samuel and wants with all of us too. He doesn't call us with the voice of some you know, grandiose pagan god that he, he shoots up out of a giant fire and towers over everything and yells at us. No, he, he comes to Samuel in the form of a very unassuming voice, so much so that he didn't even realize it was God talking to him. He figured it was the priest. That's what Samuel thought was going on here. Now, it's true that God does come to people in grandiose fashion in other parts of the scripture. In Moses' case, for example, he speaks to him out of a burning bush. We're all familiar with that story. In the case of Jacob, he came to him in the form of some kind of celestial being. We don't know if that was actually God or if he sent an angel when it came to the wrestling match. But we do assume that God contacted him in, in somewhat grandiose fashion, whether he sent an angel or whether he delivered the message himself. Either way, it was certainly much more obvious that this was not a mundane thing like it happened with Samuel. So why is that? Why is the approach different? Well, I think it's because Samuel was in a very different place than Moses and Jacob. Because you remember what happened with Moses, is Moses hears the voice of the Lord, and even though he's convinced it really is God, his faith isn't very strong. He doesn't want any part of that, and he really doesn't want... God's calling, he wants to go back to his normal life of tending sheep. When God calls Jacob, Jacob is familiar with God. His father and his grandfather have been following God there, you know, for a good portion of their lives. But Jacob seems honestly kind of hesitant to fully embrace God as being a exclusive God and, and the creator of the universe and all that stuff. And you can tell by his reaction saying, basically, from this point, then God is going to be my God, that he wasn't really super 100% on board with it beforehand. And so Samuel, with the faith of a child, already has a bond with God that God feels comfortable coming to him in this very intimate and unassuming way, and that Samuel would have the faith to listen to God even if he didn't use some big grand gesture to get his attention. In other words, what God did was he observed where his child was and changed his approach and his tone to fit that person. Didn't change the message. The message of obedience and mercy and so on and so forth, that all comes out the same. Whether it's to Moses or to Jacob or to Samuel or to Abraham, God doesn't change who he is, nor does he change the core of his message. What he does change is his approach based on who is hearing the message at the time. And if we're going to be emulators of God, I think that's an important lesson for us to learn, too. That sometimes we have to change our approach. The message remains the same. The gospel always remains the same. We don't mince words. We don't beat around the bush or any of that stuff. But what we do is we understand that sometimes a more direct approach is necessary, sometimes an indirect approach is better, sometimes something where you just come out and say it is better for that person, sometimes holding off a little bit and building a relationship before you make a, a really bold statement or take something that's kind of hard to digest to that person, sometimes that's smart too, but the message remains the same. 
And if we're going to be imitators of God, if we're going to bring people to God just the way God brought these men to him, I think we need to understand that sometimes the approach might need to be a little bit different and a little bit tailor-made for that person. One big difference, though, is that God knows our hearts, and we don't. Sometimes we've got to do a little guesswork on that because we don't know a person's soul the way that God does. God knew all of that about Samuel and Moses and Jacob and Abraham and everybody else that he ever called. And so God kind of had an advantage on us, which shouldn't surprise us. But ultimately, I think even that is a comforting message. Because that means that God does know our hearts and that he approaches us in a certain way that is best for us. And that means that regardless of how he tries to communicate with us, how he tries to get our attention, how he tries to convey his messages, whether sometimes he has to use a pretty harsh approach or sometimes whether he can do it a little more gently, that means that God is looking at us. He cares enough about us to give us individualized attention. And ultimately, he knows our soul well enough to know the best way to reach out to us to bring us closer to him. That's something that fills me with an amazing amount of comfort, and I'm, I'm hoping that it does you too. Especially at a time where it seems like we're trying to take a blanket approach to everything and, and try to say one size does fit all and, and one particular way is right for everyone, I think it's important to understand that God's approach, even though his message always remains identical, Sometimes the way he presents it and the way that he presents himself is individualized and, and tailored to the person and what they need at that time. Stay the course, friends. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, woke brigade.